Well, our, our sign language interpreter tonight is Marisha Awisi. My name is Wilson Buru. Let's start with that Yebeif, uh, Yebeif uh, family follow-up saga. Where, and the families are grieving in the cause of their grief. One body currently lying at the mortuary in Eldoret. Well, both are convinced that those are the remains of their kin. So the question is, whose body is it really? Mercy Kandie explores. explores. It's a family in limbo seeking answers urgently. They want detectives to expedite investigations in order to determine the identity of the person whose body was discovered at Rivanyala in Nandi County. The recent twist to the mystery death surrounding the body that was alleged to belong to supposed ICC witness Mesha Kiebe. That is until the biometric registration revealed otherwise that it belonged to Yusuf Hussein, a matatu town from Kapsabet. The family had traveled to identify and bury their dead. The one, please, what say, dear, shut your fingerprints. What we are just asking the government, let them help us with the, his body. That's all. That's what we are requesting. We are Muslims. He's overstayed in the mortuary. Daniel Katana says the last time he saw his colleague, friend and neighbor was last year in Chevakali. As a matter of fact, we were last year, tarehe 27. We were here. 27. At the busy Kapsabet main stage, the touts say it was the norm for Yusuf to disappear and reappear, what they term as a hassle life. They also got to learn of his death yesterday via the media. Yes. Yusuf's second wife, Masi Mboga, says she identified the body. They separated in July. They last met in October to discuss their son's education. They had communicated in December last year through a friend's phone. I'm the one who identified him. I identified his one toe, Haina Kucha. Then he had a broken teeth, a half, and a scar here. That's how I identified him. Yusuf lived in Sierra Post, Nandi County. A few meters from River Yala, where the body was discovered on 31st December, being described by family and friends as a friendly person. You cannot ask police. Meanwhile, in Eldoret, human rights activist Ken Wafula dismissed the biometric results. We want fresh fingerprint examination and these fingerprints should the sample should be taken in the presence of the family the, a lawyer a representative maybe for a representative from the lsk a, a, a doctor doctors independent doctors the human rights lobbyist who has been vocal since yebe's disappearance wondered why deputy president william ruto's lawyer karim khan had raised the issue with the identity of the person whose body was found further advising that a dna test be conducted. The body which had been lying at the Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital mortuary in Eldoret since December 31st last year is now at the center of controversy with two families strongly maintaining that it belongs to their kin. Both families, Yebeis and Yusufs, are still adamant that the body is that of their kin, citing unique physical structures. As investigations continue and the family of Hussein Yusuf travel to Busia, it's their hope that come Monday they'll make one final trip to Eldoret, that of taking the body of their brother, their son and a father to bury him, this according to their religious beliefs. Masi Kandia KTN, Kapsabet, Nandi County. Sad situation for those two families. Now, the Consumer Federation of Kenya is not satisfied with yesterday's fuel prices review by the Energy Review Commission. The consumer governing body says that following the global decline of fuel prices by more than 50%, the local prices should be reduced even further. Sharon Momanyi tells us more. Motorists continue to benefit from falling pump prices with a further price slash by the Energy Regulatory Commission yesterday. 
The latest review by the commission now sees a litre of super petrol in Nairobi retailing at 92 shillings and 88 cents after shedding off 9 shillings and 13 cents. Diesel retailing at 83 shillings and 35 cents after dropping by 7 shillings and 50 cents. And kerosene at 65 shillings and 59 cents decreasing by 5 shillings and 78 cents. The prices are even lower in Mombasa, Kisumu and Nakuru. I am feeling a very good change in the fuel prices. Um, we used to fill up the car with like 4-5, now you fill it up with like 3-2, so the savings is very good. You can do something else with your savings. However, the Consumer Federation of Kenya is not satisfied with this review, stating that the pump prices ought to have dropped by more than 17 shillings following the global drop in these prices. Tuna walagai wengi. Na walagai wanajita wanabiashara. Shida ni kwamba serikali inaonekana ni kana kwamba inawasaidia kufanya ile kejeli kwa wananchi. Kofex says that the fuel prices should be further reduced to reflect the global decline. The price of crude oil has dropped by $120 to $45 per barrel. The prices that apply now in the international market, we cannot benefit them because the products, even if we were to start bringing them today, will only arrive here after that to 45 days. In the last six months, the price of crude oil has dropped by 58%, whereas the prices here in the country only dropped by 20%. So, why has the 38% drop been disregarded in Kenya? The products we have locally are refined products. In other words, they have already gone through a process from the crude primary product to being processed. And uh, what happens in any processing uh, plant is the fact that you incur cost from the pri primary products to the finished products. At the moment, commuters are challenging the government to also reduce public transport fares following the fall in fuel prices. A spot check by KTN Wednesday morning indicated that some petrol stations were still selling fuel at the previous prices. A call for motorists to be watchful. Sharon Momani, KTN. Let's stick with our story. And as Sharon Momani says, the prices of food, the price of food is yet to come down, even though the cost of living is closely linked to the cost of fuel. Now, here's Edith Kimani, who is now going to provide for us some insight into this. When you go past any petrol station and you look at those figures, they are the lowest they have been in the last four years. But the question is, do these figures actually relate to the cost of living? Do lower fuel prices actually mean that the cost of consumer products such as tomatoes and onions and maize flour will actually go down? That's what we're interrogating this evening. And to do that, we look at three key indicators. Fuel, electricity, which is also greatly affected by the cost of fuel, as we know, and the CPI, what is basically basically consumer product indices. This is the average cost of your daily consumer products, as I mentioned earlier, um, and what they cost that month. And so we begin with January of last year. The cost of fuel, petrol was retailing at 110.59 shillings, diesel 104.73. The cost of electricity that month, for every 50 kilowatt hours, you were paying an average of 526.70 shillings. The CPI that month, the average, remember that figure we were talking about? 145.40. So we've created a really nice baseline. We know that when the cost of fuel is just over 100 shillings for petrol, then the electricity will be at an average of 520 shillings or just over 500 shillings and the CPI is just over 100 shillings. So what happens when the cost of fuel goes up? And so to, do, to, to, to find out what happens, we look at what must have been the most expensive month for fuel last year, which is the month of July. And fuel, petrol, was retailing at 114.62 shillings while diesel was going at 100 and 4.81 shillings. So a very marginal increase in the cost of diesel, but electricity shooting up to 691 shillings. And this is 691 shillings for every 50 kilowatt hours. So we're maintaining that. And the CPI going up as well at 150.60 shillings. So what happened towards the end of last year? We look at December. By the way, these figures that we're using are coming from both the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics and also the Energy Regulatory Commission. And so we look at the month of December where fuel was retailing at 106 shillings. So this is December, um, November to December of last year. 106 shillings for petrol, diesel, retailing at
at 94 shillings, so going down quite drastically. Electricity also coming down for every 50 kilowatt hours, uh, 521.54. But this is what is most interesting. The CPI actually went up, and observers say that it could take a while for us to actually feel the effects um, of this. And because the CPI is also determined by more than petrol, of course, we know about rains. Um, and so that's how things stand at the moment. Currently, petrol is retailing at 92.88 shillings, and diesel is retailing at 83.35 shillings. It could happen that next month, when you look at these figures, this one will have gone especially low, and we're also hoping to see this one decrease as well. And so that's where we stand at the moment. I'm Edith Kimani. Thank you, Edith. Very informative. We can mm. see there's definitely a correlation between, a very strong correlation between the two. But the question we want to ask you this evening is whether this has actually affected your wallet. Have you actually felt the effect of the falling prices, uh, the falling fuel prices, that is, in the last two months? Do let us know whether you have or whether you haven't. That's the thing. And remember that um, these fuel prices actually started coming down about two or three months ago. So this is, have you felt this in the last two or three months? That is what we're asking you. You can get in touch with us on SMS. The number is 22155 at Wilson underscore Mburu at Kachungira. Those are our Twitter handles and we'll of course sample your views as the bulletin continues. When you send in an SMS, make sure you start with the yes or no so that you are able to tally that as a poll result at the end of this live newscast. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, the IEBC has cleared four candidates for the Homer Bay senatorial by-election that is slated for next month. Yes, Katie and Victor Ogale with the details. On a day that Homa Bay residents expected to escort their various candidates to present their papers ahead of the Homa Bay Senatorial by elections in February, United Democratic Movement candidate Silas Jekakimba opted out of the race, citing security reasons. Jekakimba further claimed that he had received threats on his life. Several things have since transpired including, but not limited, to direct security threats on the one hand, I wish to, with all humility and gratitude to my supporters from across the widths and breadths of the county, forthwith withdraw my candidature from the current contest. At a glance, no one could have imagined just how busy it was going to be at the IBC offices in Homabe as the officials awaited the candidates to present their papers. At midday, Moses Kajuang arrived together with Orange Democratic Movement Top Brass. <laughs> Kajuang supporters who came out in numbers at some point overwhelmed the available security organs, though they were later contained. <laughs> And we promise the people of Homa Bay a great and resounding victory and uh, proper service. Um, and, and I also want to encourage the people of Homa Bay to come out in large numbers. This is a partisan campaign. Other political parties will also front their people. And uh, we meet in the field. I have a right as a leader of a movement to campaign for the candidate of my party. ODM chairman John Badi appeared to be reading from a different script from that of Jack Akimba, who is a well-known Raila AD. I'm yet to get official communication uh, regarding Jack Akimba's uh, stepping down and uh, getting to understand what security concerns that he has. Of the five who presented their papers, only three were cleared. Kajuang, former Rango member of parliament, and Professor Luke Misama. It has been a, a very, uh, very, very anxious time for lots of people in order to see this process go through in the best way. This morning, I came before the IEPC officials and I have presented my papers. Five candidates have presented their papers to the IEBC here in Homa Bay ahead of the senatorial by-election to be held in February. A similar number is expected to do the same on Friday. Victor Ogale, KTN in the county of Homabi. Let's stick with politics and politicians and Gatundu South Member of Parliament Moses Kuria has now 30 days to apologize in all the national dailies, televisions, public barrazes and in his personal social media accounts of a hate speech remarks he made. Milimani Senior Principal Magistrate Enoch Cherono says Kuria risked prosecution should he fail to do this. Hey, 
Gatundu South MP Moses Kuria appeared in court for an update on the reconciliation process he undertook aimed at promoting national cohesion and integration. Kuria faces charges of incitement to violence, hate speech and ethnic contempt over remarks he made on social media linking members of a certain Kenyan community to sporadic terrorist attacks last year. The law society of Kenya Secretary Apollo Mboya says the suit against Moses Kuria has not been dropped pending agreement on the conditions set out for pacification. Maurice Zoro, who chairs the committee supervising the reconciliation, had instructed Moses Kuria to make a public apology in the national dailies and television as well as meeting the costs. Kuria's lawyers told the court their client has taken steps towards reconciliation and has to be given a month to conclude the process. In one of his conciliation apology in the dailies, Kuria says as a leader, he has come to the realization that values and principles that unite Kenyans are for the national good. Kuria says he is remorseful that on 16th May 2014, he made comments on his Facebook page that were deemed offensive to certain communities. Kuria says the comments were made in the heat of the moment and wants Kenyans to forgive him for the lapse in personal judgment. The lawmaker says the comments were made after a terrorist attack at Gikomba market that allegedly elicited a lot of anger and frustration amongst Kenyans, including himself. Kuria notes the comments were inexcusable and asks for forgiveness from those he offended. LSK and NCIC observed that Kuria's online posts amid heightened terrorist activity incited the public to violence against targeted community with the potential of eliciting chaos. Kuria is out on a 5 million shillings bail which was extended to the next mentioned date. The case will be mentioned on February 14th for an update on the proposed reconciliation. Patrick Amimo, KTN. Welcome back. You're watching KTN Prime. Now, talking to KTN yesterday, Senate Speaker Ekwe Thuro said he would like to see the row between the government and the opposition on the controversial new security laws resolved amicably. You come from the northern side or northern part of Kenya, and uh, on a number of occasions there are conflicts in those areas. Uh, in your new role as Senate Speaker, do you think you have a, an, an integral role to play in pacifying that region? Well, I have a role in terms of uh, the, the position uh, which this country has given me, and somebody coming from there with a bit of uh, understanding. Uh, and to see how we can use uh, every opportunity available to resolve this uh, really, really bad culture uh, that we need to stem out from our, our practice and so that our people can engage in more productive endeavors rather than this uh, really mindless uh, loss of lives. We as a Senate of Kenya, on behalf of the Parliament of Kenya, are uh, privileged to host a regional summit of parliaments from 12 countries in the Great Lakes region and uh, be one of those key issues we are going to discuss is the political situation and the security situation and the security situation inevitably will involve terrorism and catastrophe. Okay, as a member of the government uh, we, we know there are a number of issues that are affecting the country uh, right now. The unrest, the security matters, the labor disputes. Uh, how would you gauge the way, the manner in which the Jubilee government is handling the situation so far? I think the Jubilee administration, uh, in my view, has done very well. Uh, the Jubilee government has embarked on a very ambitious program. You are talking about about the Lapset project. This is the second uh, corridor after the Southern Corridor. So after 100 years of building that railway. Well, we are thinking of another one, so basic infrastructure, just to lay the foundations on which the economy can prosper. The challenges of labor and rest and the rest, uh, you know, teacher strikes did not start with the Jubilee government. They have always been there, and I think the discussions are, are ongoing. I am convinced that uh, we'll be able to reach an amicable solution that is uh, 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 all parties will be happy to, de to deal with. Okay. Lastly, uh, how are you seeing the Senate uh, that maybe in the next uh, few years? Are we going to see a much stronger, I'm not saying the Senate is weak, but are we going to see the Senate that uh, probably Kenyans have not yet seen? Uh, the feedback I get uh, when, when I, uh, I move around the country is that uh, people, people say the Senate 
is a sober house. Uh, Senate, we are fortunate, we have some of the best brains in this country uh, within adequate exper experience, you know that. And so, in fact, uh, most of the people have been uh, accusing us of like, we have no job. They seem to be the ones wanting to take even the little job that they think we have. When w for us, we are saying we have sufficient uh, uh, work which you want to do. Uh, is other people who are trying even that work uh, not to allow us to do. I mean, when you have like the impeachment of the governor, that is a quasi uh, judicial parliamentary process. You must allow it to continue. There is, there is no reason why a governor should be quick to go to court when actually the next course should be to appeal to the Senate and make the same case before the Senate. Then when the Senate concludes that parliamentary initiative, then they can be at liberty to go to court because court is always available to all Kenyans. But we need to, as Kenyans, invest in our institutions. We need to allow those institutions to work, to, 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 to prosper. Some of these institutions are new. So in a way, I understand when people are, are, are not very sure. But I am convinced in the next couple of years, Kenyans will come to appreciate why on August 27, 2010, they voted for a constitution with the Senate. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. A very good evening and welcome to KTN Business. My name is Abi Agina. And just before we start, yesterday we promised you that we'll be following up on the issue of the Matatu Fairs. And the Transport Cabinet Secretary, Michael Kamau, has challenged public service vehicle owners to accord commuters the benefit of the recent drop in fuel prices by lowering fares. Kamau added that it was unfair for commuters to pay higher prices, especially after pump prices dropped by nearly 20% to hit a record 92 shillings for super, 83 shillings for diesel, and 65 shillings for kerosene. The net reduction has been about 17% on the pump prices. But the fares, have we seen any change? So how are to about to now in the transport sector? And all these people who are up in arms, all these NGOs that talk about uh, the cost and the government doing nothing to reduce, why don't we hear them now talking to the transporters and the transport sector to bring down the transportation costs, even by about 5% or 10%. Whenever we have a hike straight, it is an increased pop, the prices have been going down. And well, we'll be continuing to keep an eye on that development. The Kenya shilling is expected to weaken further in the month of January as dollar supply remains limited, having already dropped to 0.8% in January. So just what effect does this have on the shilling? Kitchen's Charles Gitonga has more. The Kenya shilling has maintained a losing streak since the beginning of this year. The currency opened the year at 90 shillings and 70 cents to the dollar, but by the close of business today, it was cited at 91 shillings and 35 cents, representing a 0.72% drop with expectations of a larger drop going forward. Analysts point out that the robust growth in money supply is one of the reasons that have made the shilling lose ground against the dollar. The reintroduction of capital gains tax on property and securities has also seen foreigners at the Nairobi Securities Exchange take a wait-and-see approach, limiting dollar supply. The capital gains tax uh, might have forced some investors to, to, to review their, their, you know, their position on, with regards to that and, that, and that withdrawal of support has probably led to some weakness. A weaker shilling is expected to have an impact on imports to Kenya, especially on fuel, which constitutes 19% of the country's total imports. While announcing the new fuel prices yesterday, the Energy Regulatory Commission did express fears that a weak shilling is likely to deny Kenyans the benefits of cheaper fuel in the future. If it weakens, then for the same amount of product, the consumer will have to pay more. 
However, the weaker shilling comes as an advantage to the exporters class, especially in horticulture, tea and coffee, which constitute 40% of all exports. Even for the exporters, they, they do lose out in certain ways because the in, in fertilizer imports are now more expensive. Despite a weak currency, Kenyans have continued to experience lower cost of living as inflation comes down, significantly influenced by the falling fuel and electricity prices. Inflation was quoted at 6.02% in December last year, having come down from 6.60% in September of the same year. For cost of living, that should be coming down. That should ease. Um, perhaps we'll see uh, softer, softer stands being taken, especially in uh, issues like... Um, industrial action uh, because one of the drivers of industrial action is obviously cost of living. Analysts are also projecting that the concussion of a weakening shilling and falling oil prices will have a positive rather than negative impact on the economy. Charles Gitonga, KTN. Many thanks there Charles. The Kenya Tea Development Agency has initiated a program to encourage farmers to diversify tea production. Currently, the black tea CTC variety dominates tea production locally at 99%. The agency views the diversification as a key tool to improving the sector's dwindling fortunes. Kitchens Carol Ndiri has more on that story. Having primarily cultivated the black CTC tea that is simply referred to as black tea, and that is the variety that is consumed in many Kenyan homes, many Kenyan farmers may soon going the orthodox tea way. Peter Kanyago, the KTDA national chairman, says out of the 66 factories in the country that are under the agency, 11 are currently in the process of installing additional lines that will process orthodox tea. number of factories will start uh, pro uh, uh, producing or processing orthodox teas. The move to process orthodox tea is aimed at diversifying tea production to boost the farmer's income as the earnings last year dwindled. Tea earnings last year dropped to 15.8 billion shillings, which was the lowest in the last five years due to global oversupply of the black tea variety. According to KTDA, the introduction of specialized orthodox tea varieties such as purple tea will enable farmers to fetch premium prices for their produce, lifting the sector's fortunes. The tea agency plans to install orthodox processing lines in 11 tea factories across the country at an expected cost of 660 million shillings. Kenya goes speaking at the Othaya Getuge Tea Factory's annual general meeting. New lines are expected at Chinga and Gitugi, while Kangaita in Kirinyaga is already processing the new brand. The Kenyan tea farmers need not concentrate on just one type of tea, that is the black city city, but there is need to diversify the range to teas such as purple tea if they are to attract better prices for their crop. Carol Derry, KTN, Othaya. Well, moving on, Cooperative Bank of Kenya is set to offer 3,400 scholarships to bright and needy students across the country. The bank has announced that it will provide 655 new scholarships to Form 1 students. Additionally, the bank will fund education of about 119 students through secondary school to university level. These are selected from the top performing beneficiaries of the secondary school scholarships. The bank launched the program in 2007 and provides full scholarships for secondary and university education. The scholarships are awarded on merit to promising but needy students from all regions of Kenya. Residents of Nairobi, Kiambu and Muranga counties are set to benefit from the construction of the Northern Collected Tunnel project aimed at ensuring reliable water supply. The 6.8 billion shilling project will supply Nairobi with additional 140,000 cubic meters of water daily. The tunnel will transfer raw water from intakes at Maragua, Gikigie and Irati rivers to an outlet at the Thika River upstream of the existing Thika Reservoir. Over 290,000 residents of Muranga County are said to benefit from the three water projects currently being implemented by the Athi Water Services Board. This is one and two of the master plan to be implemented between 2012 and 2016 will require 
for Nairobi City alone, $368 million. For satellite towns, it requires about $343 million. In total, 60 billion shillings or 712 million USD. We have to say goodnight now. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of KTN Prime. Our sign language, uh, sign language interpreter was Maresha Owiti. Clearly it's the end of the night. And I'm Nancy Kachungira. Do have a very good night. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good night.